not be able to stay long. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the virtual Indiana, um, sorry, I'm going to get this right, the Medicare for All March virtual. Um, I will be serving as your host. My name is Tracy, and we have several speakers here all talking about the need for single-payer health care. I've already went over with our audience um, that we're going to try to make this as brief as possible, but we're talking about an important issue that can impact us in terms of how awful our current healthcare system is and the need for um, dramatic change, which would be single payer healthcare. So again, um, my name is Tracy and I will be popping in, well not popping in, popping out. Um, I will do my best to um, be a great host, but no promises, promises. Um, so when you see this video, be sure to share this video as to many social platforms as you possibly can. Medicare for all is an extremely important issue. Single payer is the health care that is going to help Americans um, close in on disparities that impact us. So please share this to all your social medias. Um, platforms. And if you have a question of me, you can always email me at Tracy Media LLC. And my name is spelled T R A C Y M E D I A L L C at gmail.com. You can always email me your questions. We're going to get started with our first speaker. And her name is Virginia, and Virginia and I, um, we came, I, let's see, we haven't physically met, but I feel like I've known her like a really long time, and um, the emails back and forth and back and forth, but I know she's a strong advocate for Medicare for All, and last thing, we're asking our, if you have questions, put them in the chat section, I will definitely do my best to get to them. And we're asking our speakers to try to stay under 10 minutes. So Virginia, if you don't mind, I always like to let my guests introduce themselves because I figure I'm going to forget something. So if you go ahead and introduce yourself, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Virginia Cotts. I'm on the steering committee of March for Medicare for All. So I'm really glad to have you here. Today we have uh, other events going on, some actual in real life events. We have one in the East Palestine, Ohio area, which as you know, is where there was a huge uh, train derailment that spewed toxins into the atmosphere and the people there are still suffering. And the, the government isn't doing, isn't taking care of them, nor is the company, Norfolk Southern, the railway company. There's an event in Atlanta in front of the, um, the Norfolk Southern headquarters, and it's a, a direct action. People in the streets with a bullhorn, I hope they don't get arrested. And then there's also a virtual pic, not a virtual, a real life picnic in Vancouver, Washington which is bringing families together, having uh, games and children's games and collecting mutual aid, school supplies uh, for the kids in the area. And so we have those events and this one today. But here's the thing, two years ago, March for Medicare for All launched with, with 56 actions across the country and, and all demanding national improved Medicare for All. People turned out, there were people, the, the march in Los Angeles where I lived that had, had people had flash mobs in the street, uh, speakers in front of the CNN building say what, saying, why aren't you covering this? Uh, we had people in New York, we all over the country, 56 uh, cities, towns. And the next thing we knew, as soon as it was over, everybody disappeared. And, and we sort of said, where is everybody? And they said, oh, we've decided to work on CalCare. We've decided to work on whole Washington. We've decided to get a ballot initiative passed in our state. 
And so the movement is then fractured into dozens of single state uh, initiatives, single state actions. And we no longer had this mass of people working for national improved Medicare for all. Now, I don't have to tell you guys how important it is. We all know we need health care. Americans know we need health care. And I know the Democratic Party, some people here might be good Democrats. The Democratic Party wants us to be fighting in the states because they want us to stop pressuring Congress. They want us to stop pressuring their candidates and demanding that they pass an improved Medicare for all. But that just because they want us to do it doesn't mean we should be. Nancy Pelosi says, oh, the states are laboratories. You have to get, get it passed in the states first. Then we can talk about national. It's just not true. Imagine if the civil rights movement had been, had been state by state. Um, people use the people who support the state initiatives use the example of Canada that started in the, their health plan started in the provinces. But if you want to know about the difference between Canada in 1963 and the American medical industrial complex today, I'm happy to, to talk to you about it. Just, just reach out to Tracy and she'll give you my email. But let me tell you, it's not the same thing. The other thing people say is, oh, well, when it passes in a few states, people will demand it, will demand the national program. However, people already know we need the national program. We don't have to convince them. So again, this is a diversion. It's a waste of energy. And, and I, the argument is that it's all part of the same movement. Oh, CalCare, National Medicare for All, it's all health care. But it's not. The, the state-based seems like it's, it's easier to manage. It's dealing with the state legislatures. But guess what? The enemy is the same size. Those insurance companies and medical corporations and pharmaceutical corporations are all at the top of the Fortune 500. If they have the money to own Congress, they certainly have the money to own little state legislators. So um, the example of my state of California, big, rich, big, fat tax base. We have Silicon Valley, the, the entertainment industry. If we have a Democratic legislature, Democratic governor, everybody wanted CalCare. And two weeks before the vote, it was pulled. Now, how do you think that happened? The, those insurance lobbyists do this sort of thing before breakfast. They can squash a local initiative without, <laughs> while, while drinking their coffee. So, um, so please believe me when I say it is not the same movement. Um, the people say marijuana is, is being legalized at state by state, but there's a big difference. Cannabis is big business. It brings money into the state. It's, it's starting whole new industries. Healthcare costs the state. And that's the other thing I want to talk to you about is money. Whenever you talk about a program like, like Medicare for All, people say, well, who's going to pay for it? You're going to have to raise our taxes. But there's a big secret that politicians don't want us to know. And that is that the federal government creates its own money. We've been off the gold standard for 50 years. I was in college, 1971, when we went off the gold standard. Now, a dollar doesn't represent gold. It doesn't represent silver. It is the full faith and credit of the United States government. They, they create it on computers at the Federal Reserve, the central bank. They, they create money to spend, which is why, which is why when they need money for the defense budget, they don't go around and say, oh my God, we've got to raise taxes to pay for it. They just do it. They only seem to have a problem when it has to do with things that will help the people. And the reason for that is because it competes with for-profit industries. 
the medical industry, uh, insurance, pharmaceuticals. They don't want a public program for that because it will compete with their profits. It's not that the government can't afford it. Um, the, or, the other organization I'm with, Real Progressives, is committed to teaching people this kind of economic literacy. And if you have any, any questions about it, please feel free to reach out to me about that too. I would love to send you information. Um, the, the thing about, it, it makes so much sense that fracturing a movement into dozens of pieces weakens us. It, ask Hitler, they tried fighting on different fronts and lost, luckily. But, but the thing is, we, we don't have the money. We don't have the, the money to compete with the lobbyists. We can't buy off Congress. All we have is our numbers. All we have is the people. Um, when I was 13, I was lucky enough to go to the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and heard Dr. King t t give his I Had a Dream speech. There was a sea of humanity from the, from the uh, Washington Monument to Congress. Guess what? The, the Democratic Party told Dr. King, ooh, uh, don't make waves. You'd be patient. Sit back and wait. People, the, the public will be turned off if you have these big, massive demonstrations. I think what they meant was the public will be turned off by all these Black people showing up in Washington. But Dr. King didn't listen. And imagine if he had, imagine if he had said, oh, we'll go back and pass civil rights in, in Alabama first, in Georgia first. So uh, let's, let's take that to heart. Let's work together. Let's pull people back in to the national movement for national improved Medicare for all. Thanks again for coming, everyone. Thank you so much for that. Um, I know I've, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, so that means if I don't see any, I'm going to go to my next speaker. And um, the next speaker is Dr. Valerie McRae. Um, she has appeared on one of my podcasts, um, the old Tracy Takes On podcast that I used to do. Um, again, she's an advocate um, for single-payer single health care. I'm going to get that right. Single-payer health care. And she is a licensed psychiatrist. I hope I got that right. Did I get that right, Dr. McRae? Oh, I wish I was a psychiatrist. They, You're uh, a psychologist. They, they get the big bucks because they write the prescriptions. I just get <laughs> all the, the talking part of it and the... Yeah, you're the psych. I I always think you're a psychiatrist and you're a psychologist. I yes. get that. And before Dr. Uh, McCray speaks, I do want everybody to look at the message that I put, the link that I put in the chat, um, because there's going to be, like I said, a huge announcement at the end of this that I think you'll all be interested in. So I'm going to put myself on mute. And Dr. McCray, I will give you 10 minutes. And remember everyone to, um, um, if you have questions, put them in the chat. If you don't, that's fine. Um, but we will go with Dr. McCray. And of course I've asked our speakers to limit themselves to 10 minutes and we'll go there and you may go ahead and proceed Dr. McCray. Hello, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Anytime Tracy says, Hey, let's do this Medicare for uh, all March. I'm there. I did a march with Marianne Williamson in uh, Washington, D.C. as well. This is just something that's so near and dear to my heart because, for one thing, it's embarrassing that we don't have a single parent, uh, single uh, payer system. Uh, a lot of my clients, a lot of my friends are around the, the globe. And it's just embarrassing to know that they have medical care. They're not worried about that. They're not worried about parental leave, uh, especially my friends in Germany, um, medical care up in Canada. It's just embarrassing uh, that we are so, so far behind and there's absolutely no excuse. As a doctor, 
Um, I just know that there are so, so many other doctors out here like myself that are just sick and tired of all of the rigmarole we're taking through just to get paid from insurance companies anyway. If we could use the other, that part of our energy in taking care of our clients that we have to spend in billing um, and hiring someone to bill and send and payments going back and forth and being refused. And it's just a mess. It's a, we have to keep remembering that insurance companies are just risk management companies. So their whole job is to, to pay out as less as, as least as possible. It doesn't make sense. So for so many different reasons, mainly because it's just cheaper, uh, it will be less expensive for everyone. I think that most American people, from what I've read, they are willing to pay more taxes if they knew their money was going towards uh, health care. Uh, they're willing to pay that. But even though it's going to be cheaper in the long run, um, it's better for small businesses to not have to shuffle all of this information about, okay, what health care system are we going to give to our, our people? And I don't know if you noticed or not, uh, but each year you get less and less for the insurance company with the higher and higher premiums. So they're having to go to their employees and say, oh, we've got a great new package for you, but actually they're getting less and less and less and less for their books. And what we're seeing now is just a illusion of choice with these insurance companies. Do you want the, the platinum program where you pay so much up front, or do you want the gold program where you're paying so much free prescriptions? It's still just moving the same monies around to give you less care and more money going towards administration, advertising, and to the shareholders. That money could be going into the actual care of our society. If we are a healthy America um, and we're not only physically healthy, but we have a country right now, whereas even if you manage to get past your illness, you have to worry about that big bill that's going to actually make you sick when you, <laughs> when you get that big bill. I don't care what insurance you have. When you get that big bill, you're going to be sick. Now, small businesses like myself, there are times when I don't have health insurance at all. Uh, I run for office. And when I'm running for office, I really don't work as much. Um, and I, I have to really watch my health because I don't have health insurance much of the time. Um, I rely heavily on homeopathic remedies and, and, and just staying uh, healthy. There's a lot of us out here like that who can't afford to get sick because we just can't afford the 600 $700, $800 a month health care uh, insurance under how we're working or if we're small entrepreneurs or that sort of thing. Um, one of the things that I uh, want, I'm going, I'm running for Senate, U.S. Senate, uh, hopefully taking uh, Mike Braun's place. I am running as a Democrat. I don't think this is a Democrat or a Republican conversation. This is a human conversation that needs to go past any type of arguments about whether this is the Democrats are holding us up or the Republicans holding us up. This is a human conversation and we have to find those people that are for what makes sense, which is a single pair Medicare, medical care for all system. One of the things as a Senator, if that's uh, the Senate right now, there's a bill, uh, HR, um, it's a joint resolution, number 13, is to get money out of politics. I think that is our main thing, because as long as you've got insurance companies and all these different lobbyists paying these big bucks to get politicians in office, I don't know how soon we can get to what we actually need, which is medical care for every citizen, every person here in the United States. Uh, I think we first have to get um, while we're working on this, it's not a, while we're working diligently for medical care for all, we also have to make sure we get reverse citizens united and get the money out of politics so we, the, our politicians can work for the people and not work for the people who are paying for their politics. Does that make sense? So that's, that's one of the major goals and that's 
that's a resolution that was proposed just recently in January, 2023. Uh, it's HR um, RES 13, uh, Joint Resolution 13. Uh, and this is uh, coming up this year. So hopefully we can get that, they can get that through. If not, I'm running, I'm gonna be pushing that through as well as Medicare for all uh, as well. So with that being said, uh, any questions I, you have at the end, I'll be more than happy uh, to talk to you about it. There are some comments in the chat and I thank everybody for putting those in there. And I'll ask, um, since our other two speakers haven't spoken yet, if um, Virginia or-, or you I Dr. think I, I give my response. Yeah, did you? Yeah. Okay, so one of the things um, that were put in here um, says the thing is that taxes aren't even needed to fund that Medicare. Medi I always want to say Medicaid, single payer health care. I'll just say single payer health care. I thought that was a really good point to make. And Virginia made a point about a third of every health care dollar goes to profit and not to care. So I think we need to be talking to our, you know, in our conversations with people, we need to be really um, putting in those two points because we're always gonna have the people that say, oh, well, how are you gonna pay for it? And it's like, no, Virginia said it better than I could that the federal government literally in Virginia, if I'm misquoting you, please correct me, they print their own money. You know, when it comes to defense spending, I have never heard a politician, Democrat or Republican ever say, how are we gonna pay for these messes? I wonder how we're gonna pay for the wars. I, I've, ne I've never heard it. Anybody else that's ever heard it, you can just let me know. Um, I but, think that there, there, there's an assumption about taxes, but even if you say that there's no taxes or no increase in taxes, there are people that are that are willing to pay that. Most people are willing to pay a little extra or whatever if that's what it takes. Because think how much you're paying out of pocket for premiums. Uh, you're paying out of pocket for uh, copays. You're paying out of pocket for uh, prescriptions, and it's to the tune of about nine thousand dollars now. Uh, that may not even represent an increase on the bottom line, even if it were any other types of increases, but you're right. It probably does not um, require taxes. That's something we, that's a conversation we've always had. And based on the other countries that we're dealing with, they do have, it is somewhat of a tax base and somewhat of a, um, a base with their uh, businesses as well. So just going by what other countries are doing uh, we, we sort of have that template, but we don't necessarily have to use that template. You're right. Exactly. And, um, oh, we do have another comment. Okay, let's see. Um, and I'll just kind of read these briefly. We should tax the rich because they're not too rich. They're not too rich, but not because we because, need because they them. are too rich, Tracy. Yeah, they are too rich. Thank you for correct. Thank you for correcting me. I didn't want to wear my glasses because I just don't like the way glasses look on me. But yes, <laughs> um, I should put them on because I definitely skipped a word. Um, and Sandy says I spent the year in Norway, and their people are very happy to pay higher taxes for universal health care. Um. And Americans seem hesitant to do that. Although, again, I personally don't think it's needed. I think if we can make excuses to buy missiles, we can make it. We can get healthcare to people free of charge. I, I don't see the need to do it, but understand that's the way other countries are based. So um, we're running a very good time here. So before I introduce my next speaker, does anybody that hasn't spoke that isn't named Dr. Stone and isn't named Pastor Green, do you all have, and isn't named Valerie or Virginia, are there other thoughts that you want to offer at this point? We have a we have quite a few minutes. I thought this was going to be an hour and we're not even at 20 minutes yet. Nobody has a comment. Okay. Let's keep going. Yes. 
And then that gives me more time as it, um, at the end to do my stand-up. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm not going to do my stand-up. Um, so I want to introduce my next speaker who I haven't met, but I've heard a lot about. And that's um, Pastor David Green. He pastors, and if I get this wrong, please correct me. It's not Second Baptist. It's Purpose of Life Ministries. I got that right. Oh, good. <laughs> Oh, good. I was going to say, please, Trace, don't call it second. That was because that's what I know it as. But now I got it. So he is definitely an advocate um, for single payer health care um, coming from the faith community, which is a community um, we don't hear a lot from in terms of this movement. It's a very underserved um, community that we just don't hear about. And we need to, which is why I was pressing, okay, we need to get someone from the faith community out there who's speaking. So um, I am going to just put myself on mute and let him speak. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Reverend David W. Green, Sr., Senior Pastor of Purpose of Life Ministries. I also serve as the president of the Concerned Clergy of Indianapolis. Clearly, as a Christian, we, you know, we're commanded to love our neighbors, and the Bible teaches us to care for others, especially the underserved. And this, these teachings are true for all of our brothers and sisters, whether they're Muslim, Jewish faith, other religious traditions. And Tracy, there needs to be more of a voice because I see a lot of this as a moral issue. When we fail to not have a single payer healthcare system, we're failing individuals. And so that's a moral issue. And that we're seeing it play out continuously in Indiana with just recently effective July the 1st as a result of the previous legislative session. You know, the, the, the session ended saying, okay, individuals need and families need to renew their Medicaid. And thus far, uh, 22 days into July, over 100,000 Hoosiers have lost their Medicaid. It's continuing to create, create more havoc in our communities. It clearly demonstrates that as a system, we're more concerned about profit than we are about people. When all this is said and done, people are gonna talk about our great surplus, but they're not gonna talk about the suffering of Hoosiers. And so I believe that the faith-based community across the spectrum needs to challenge all of these uh, uh, lawmakers and people of great influence, these great business owners of insurance companies, et cetera. Like, how do you do that? Because people are suffering as a result of choices that are made in, in regards to this renewing of Medicaid. It was stopped during COVID and there's been appeals all uh, by myself and others to say, why don't you give people time to, because there's no communication strategy, right? To let everybody know this is going on that you could potentially lose your Medicaid. Uh, these things tend to go out pre-COVID. It just went out in a white envelope. It didn't say that it was important. It didn't say it was related to your insurance. People do this knowing that people are not gonna renew timely. They're gonna get caught up in a process and it's just a way of, quote unquote, saving money, putting money in uh, profits in people's pocketbooks, but it does not meet the needs of our Hoosiers. It's a moral issue, or piece of it is a moral issue, that I think that we all must raise, because if you can sit and watch people suffer needlessly, deal with illnesses that they shouldn't have to deal with in the way they're doing it, because as uh, you were stating earlier, yeah, you, even if you go to, you got insurance, you're going to see this big old bill. Well, imagine it when you don't and you go and your Medicaid has been rejected. You don't have anything. They're still going to come after you trying to get some money. It creates even more mental health trauma in our community. I'm reminded of what Nelson Mandela once said. He said, poverty is not an accident like slavery and apartheid, it's man-made and it can be removed by the actions of human beings. 
So I believe we all must do the right thing. We must challenge others to do the right thing as well. Not be comfortable with we're going to give so-and-so a free pass or we're going to make them a little bit uncomfortable with their decision or choices. I think because of the health disparities that exist, we must push for a single payer healthcare system. We must be bold about it. And it takes all of us doing our part. Thanks for coming. So I know people get nervous when the preacher gets the mic. I don't want to take up too much time, Tracy. I'm going to say keep going because it's literally 139. And I said, oh, 230, let's just go. I saw Paul flapping in the bottom. I'm like, okay, Paul, we're going to get a congregation. It's not Sunday yet. <laughs> I was about to put in amen because you said, you have said a lot. And as a person of faith, it amazes me that we're so absent from this very, very extremely, I keep saying very, very, very important discussion. And it seems like when I'm talking about it, I am not the best spokesperson for single payer healthcare. I realize that, I get it, I'm not. But when I'm speaking about the need, it's just, okay, well, if I just pray, pray. Prayer is important. Do not get me wrong. But I always say faith without works is dead. And we have a lot of work just to engage our faith community to kind of get that message because it's something that we're doing, especially Christians, because I can't talk about any other religion. I don't practice any other religion. I only practice one. We're just not getting it. And I don't know why. And I thought, you know what? Let me find someone that is that works in the faith community that gets it. Because clearly, I don't know how to, I do not know how to bridge that conversation. So I'm so glad that that you came here today to speak to us about something we already know. It's it's just really time for the faith community to step this game up. And I know I said put the questions in the chat, but I don't see anything in the chat. Nobody said, Tracy, we can't see your pimple. Nobody said anything. So we're going to just keep going. Um, and that's going to give me more time at the end to talk. So thank you. Um, no, I'll, I'll be brief because I tend to um, stumble a lot when I speak, so I won't be long. So the next speaker is someone who I consider a friend. I don't know if he considers me his, um, but Dr. Stone is one of the first people who, when I started this whole, oh, let's have a march. And we did, last year, we actually did a march in the heat. Yeah. And yes, yeah, yeah, see, that's what everybody remembers, that it was hot, which is why I thought, oh, well, let's just have it virtual. But we did a physical march last year. And I kept saying, you know, who should who should we get to speak? And people said, Dr. Rob Stone. And I've talked to um, Dr. Stone several times um, about his work and with, I'm gonna get this wrong, Dr. Stone, but you can correct me, PNP? PNHP, I'll talk about it. <sighs> See, I knew I was gonna get it wrong. So, um, Yes, just like I said, I'm I'm just glad that he um, wanted to do this again this year and talk about the need for single payer health care. So I'm going to put myself on mute and let Dr. Stone speak. Well, thank you, Tracy. And uh, I feel like you are a wonderful friend and I'm honored that you consider me your friend. And uh, so since we're so much ahead of schedule, can I talk for an hour and 10 minutes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so that's Pastor Green's job. See, okay. that's what he's supposed to do. He speaks an hour and 10 minutes and then we, and then they'll have to say, I won't keep you long. They won't just know, you know, it'll be Sunday morning that way. And I've been on, I've been on a, 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 at least one other time, Pastor Green and I have been on a, a bill together, uh, and he's always been good about, uh, uh, I'm worse, I think, about running on, uh, running my mouth and talking and talking, but I better get started here if the, if the clock is running. So um, 
I'm a Hoosier doctor. I was born in Evansville, and I've been practicing medicine in Bloomington since 1983. In 2005, we started the first Medicare for All group in Indiana, uh, and it was also the chapter, the Indiana chapter of Physicians for National Health Program, or PNHP, which is a national group. In 2007, we teamed up with the legendary Charlie Brown, who was an Indiana House representative from Gary, and we actually we actually um, not, uh, submitted a bill into the Indiana legislature to establish a universal health care program in the state of Indiana. That was long forgotten, though. Uh, it didn't pass, uh, but the original HIP, or Healthy Indiana Plan, did come out of that session. And clearly, we need a national solution, not a state solution. So I'm completely on board with Virginia uh, on this. Um, our system, uh, but our work locally here is to build support in this really red state for a system of quality, affordable health care for all. Everybody in, nobody out. That's our slogan. Um, and um, so as I talk on, I want to tell you that uh, us speakers did not talk with each other to coordinate uh, what we're going to say. But what I'm going to say, you're going you're gonna to find merges in with exactly what everybody else has been saying. So what I've seen over these past 18 years that I've been a, an activist working for Medicare for All is that we have made some progress, especially getting Indiana to accept the Medicaid expansion, what's called HIP 2.0, and I'll say more about that in a minute. But we've also seen so many things that are getting worse, with hospital systems merging and raising prices, rural hospitals closing, growing medical debt. And now, we're, as Reverend Green said, we, we've seen over 100,000 people lose their Medicare coverage already. And Medicaid. Medicaid coverage, thank you, um, already. And, and, and over a quarter million people are at risk of losing their Medicaid. And this is all related to what's called the ending of the federal COVID emergency measures and the Medicaid unwinding. Uh, and a broad coalition of folks, uh, including the Concerned Clergy and uh, Medicare, for all in, Medicare for All Indiana folks and all sorts of others, have been working to try to minimize the, min the damage from this. But people are suffering. Lives are already being lost. And medical debt is already increasing. And Indiana is already one of the unhealthiest states in the nation. Our maternal and our child mortality numbers are atrocious. They're a disgrace. They're an international embarrassment. Our communities of color are suffering disproportionately. It's a sad old story. Um, in the cities and in the rural areas, access to health care is getting worse, not better. So what can we do? Giving up is not an option. So our healthcare system is not a system, and it's not about care. It's all about creating profit, not providing care, and it's driven by greed. The insurance companies are fighting it out with the hospital systems, who are fighting it out with the doctors and nurses, who are finding it harder and harder to care for their patients, because all of them are fighting. I call it fighting, but they call it competition. They claim that the market will magically fix everything, and I don't believe in that magic. I also don't believe in oversimplifying things, but actually this isn't that hard to fix. We just need to look at the rest of the world and see what they've already done where all the developed countries, all the wealthy democracies like ours have accepted that providing health care for everyone is necessary. It's so obvious the government guarantees health care universally. And we see as we look around the world that we have the most expensive health care, by far the highest costs. And yet our health care is terrible compared to Canada, to Europe, to Australia, Japan. By any objective measurement, we do not have the best health care in the world. But you still hear politicians saying that. And I want you to remember that if you hear a politician, if it comes out of their mouth, in America, we have the best health care in the world, you can just stop listening right now. You can just turn them off because they're not reality-based. 
They're going to keep lying, though, because it takes the pressure off of them to support real changes. But right now, we've got a healthcare system that is cruel and dangerous to our health. And I want to look again locally in Indiana, because one of the biggest health insurance companies is here, Anthem Blue Cross, based in Indianapolis, except they changed their name to Elevance Health. Elevance. What does that mean? Well, I, I pulled this quote off of their website today. Elevance Health brings together the concepts of elevate and advance, exemplified by our bold purpose of improving the health of humanity. We are a health company dedicated to making real progress toward improving the health of the people and communities we serve. <laughs> Gag me. I mean, what is that? So health insurance are like all for-profit companies. Their purpose is to make a return for their shareholders to have more income than expense at the end of the year. Simply put, their income comes from mostly from our premiums, the money we send them, and their expenses are what they spend on providing health care for us. So they profit by increasing their income and trying as hard as they can to pay as little as possible to provide health care. I went to medical school to take care of sick people. The insurance companies are trying as hard as they can to not pay for caring for sick people. So I am opposed to the existence of for-profit health insurance companies. I'm opposed to Indiana not-for-profit hospital systems buying up their competition, buying up all the doctors in the state, building monopoly power, raising the prices through the roof. I'm opposed to the current Indiana state government, which is not doing everything in its power to expand medical coverage instead of letting hundreds of thousands of Hoosiers lose what little health care they have. I could go on. Here's what I'm in favor of. Here's what I'm going to continue to fight for. Standing up for our right for health care. We already have a system of universal health care in this country. Universal if you're age 65 or over, and it's called Medicare, and it's not perfect. That's why we say improve and expand Medicare. It's a great place to start. We have to get everybody protected, everybody in, nobody out because Medicare is already taking care of the oldest. I'm on Medicare. I'm old. Uh, the sickest and the most expensive people, therefore, we're already taking care of them. And Medicare has been around for 50 years, over 50 years. In fact, Medicare's 58th birthday is coming up July 29th. So happy birthday, Medicare. When I got on Medicare, even though I'm a doctor, I felt like, what a relief. I'm safe. I'm protected. Um, this, this, this is good. Everybody should have this. And economists agree that using Medicare as the basis for healthcare reform and essentially getting rid of the health insurance companies, it makes economic sense. In fact, they estimate that if we expand Medicare to cover everyone, it would end up costing us less than we are currently spending, and we would have a healthier and happier nation. So, Everybody in, nobody out, Medicare for all. That's what I say. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Stone, for that. I appreciate um, that. Um, and I still see no questions in the comment section, although I do see a comment. Elephant, elephant is the elephant in the room. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, so that leaves me. Ha ha ha. Hi, everybody. Um, I did not ask anybody to introduce me because I just don't think um, I pretty much don't think I deserve that. Um, our speakers do. I don't. Um, but I got involved in this a couple years ago. And this is going to make sense at the end. It is not going to make sense now. And ignore the fire engine in the back. Um, I'm tired. I'm so sick of the healthcare system in our country. 
I'm tired of hearing stories about people that have to choose between medicine and food. I'm tired of hearing about people having to file bankruptcy because their medical bills are so enormous that they can't pay them. I'm tired of hearing about people being kicked off of Medicaid because our president decided to cancel that. That was such a great thing to do for COVID is to expand Medicaid so that people could, could you know, it expanded Medicaid so more people could get on and get the health care that they needed. As soon as that emergency was lifted, I'm not sure if anybody pointed out to our current administration how detrimental that was going to be, but it makes me mad. It makes me angry that I hear people in Congress, both Democrats and Republicans say, oh no, we don't, you don't deserve health care. You don't need it. It costs too much. And yet they have the access to the best health care in the world with no out-of-pocket expenses. It makes me mad that people aren't demanding the health care that we need. It makes me mad that we have lobbyists that will get millions and perhaps billions of dollars to work against healthy people. That doesn't make sense to me. So when I started thinking, how best can I put my efforts into getting single payer health care? This March was the literally the first thing that I thought of because we need to get as many people on the table. Now I know, um, you know, people say marches don't do enough work and marches are not a good way to get public engagement. And I agree, here comes my however portion. When people say that, I always turn the question around and I ask, what is it that you're doing? Or what is it that you suggest? And so what I'm suggesting is this, I'm suggesting for myself that I'm tired of writing letters to Congress people that are not going to listen to anything that I say because they are bought out by corporate interests or lobbying groups. I'm not writing any more letters. I'm not making any more phone calls. This is just me um, that's doing, that has taken that stance. I think there's two ways that we get healthcare. Either number one, we do a massive five to 10 million people march on Washington, or we do a massive worker strike. Those are the two things that I think it's going to take. We have to make these Congress people know we mean business. I'm not proposing either one, but I'm saying, in my opinion, this is what it takes. There has to be something that we can do to get people to advocate for their best interests. And I've heard, you know, pros and cons to both because they both have their, um, they have their downsets and they have their, you know, they have their pros and cons. And it's, frustrating to me that I hear people say oh well the government they're full of access and I'm like do you realize that private companies increase costs and when the government does it the costs actually decrease and so what I've decided to do is this there is going to be a documentary that Tracy Media produces I'm going to start in March of next year, and I'm going to gather stories from people, hopefully all across the nation, about how they've been affected by the healthcare system. Because I think if people can hear the stories of people affected by the system, that makes it more relatable. Um, and that's no slight to anybody here. We're all advocates. We understand the lingo. But I think it's time for us to make the public realize, hey, you've got to speak up for this. Because if you don't speak up for this, it's not going to happen. So I've decided on my own 
to start the process of making a document. I will be calling it one of two things. Either you make me sick or I will call it, I'm sick of this mess. One of the two, I will be calling. I don't know which one yet. However, if you look in your chat, there is a link to a website that I am still developing. Um, it's the very, very first message. And you all will be getting a letter about my fundraising campaign because this work is not free. I did not want to post this, but sometimes when you're advocating, you need help. So again, it's going to be my hope to interview people all around the country about what their experience is with our current U.S. system. So if you are a healthcare professional, if you are an advocate, if you've experienced something in the healthcare system that you want to talk about or know of a person that wants to talk about that, there's an email that I gave out before, which is my personal email, tracymediallc at gmail.com. You'll be hearing me talk about this. Like I said, I don't expect to get started until around March. But as far as me doing it, I think that's what I can do. As I stated before, I'm not the best spokesperson for Medicare for All, but I understand that we need it. And I understand that it's going to take a lot of work to get there. And it's going to take a lot of public education. I mean, the public knows that they need it, but they don't know how to get it. So in the meantime, I plan on acting like I have Medicare for all. I plan on talking like I have Medicare for all. I plan on speaking as though we have it. And then last step, I'm just going to go get it. That, that's, just, that's just the mind frame that I'm in. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you may take yourself off of mute is, um, and just speak to me and tell me how crazy my idea is or just whatever is on your um, mind to say. Anybody. I think it's just crazy enough that uh, we better do it. Yeah. Yes. Um, my thing is this, is that most movements, I think we're at a time where everyone is just so in shock at how expensive every little pill is. There's some pills out there now that are $700 a pill for cancer and things like that. Um, and it's only that expensive because of the profits that are being made off of these drugs. So um, it, a lot of these things are just ridiculous. I think that when you get inundated with these bills and these problems, you're so beat down that you can't move. Uh, when you're starting a movement, I will tell you this, Tracy, is that movements seem to gain momentum with a little bit of success. When things get a little bit better, people get the energy to sort of get behind it. And you would think that when things are at an all time low, and I think that's what's happening, is that things are just at a, such a all time, you know, it's just so ridiculous what's happening with our healthcare system that people can't move. But if we start talking about a, a little bit of the successes, and I want to think about uh, Mark, um, so Mark Cuban, uh, that has opened a pharmaceutical company um, to make pharmaceuticals um, affordable. I think when we talk about stories like that as well, people that are actually fighting the system, doing uh, everything that they can to bring down the cost. Uh, these are millionaires that are saying, "There's that's particular millionaire that's saying, hey, I'm going to open my own pharmaceutical company to make a pharmaceuticals a little bit, a lot more affordable for people. If we could highlight stories, if you could highlight the success stories as well, I think you'll get even more people behind, uh, 
movement that we have to have a little bit of success to say something's changing here. It's getting better. It's possible. It's possible. Just a little bit of possibility gives people the energy to march, gives energy people the energy to do uh, great things. So we got to find the successes in the stories as well of people that are making these things happen behind the scenes. People like yourselves, actually. You're the story, Tracy. Oh, uh, no, I'm not. I, 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 like I said. The Rob is the story. You guys are, you guys mm -hmm. are the story. So start with the people that are making it happen, that are doing the best that they can, and not necessarily the people that are being beat down because they're, they're just too beat down to do anything. So start with the success, and then we build from there. Thank yeah, you. I, I kind of agree with her. Um, I, I run United Activists in Fort Wayne here, and activists in general are just worn out, tired, exhausted mentally, physically. Um, I, I heard at the beginning, you know, someone saying we're fractured with this. We are beaten down. And the people, you know, like all the historical things that have happened in recent, you know, recently um, are just taking people down to a point where they're worn out. They, they're, they have little fight left in them. And it's across the board with all activism. So, yeah, they need success. They need something. They, they need something a good story to hold on to. They, they need hope. And that's yeah. what I think the people have had the hope beaten out of them. I think over the past three to four years, it has just been a beating on the people. And they're, they're, lear they're learning that they're going up against the government and the government just brings out the police to beat them down, to to take away their rights, and they change it. Like, you have the right to free speech and protest, but we'll charge you as a domestic terrorist if you do come out and protest. So, you know, they're changing the rules in the middle of the game, and they're beating the people down, and they're succeeding. So, yeah, we do need victory, and we do need some joy, you know, like everything. People in San Francisco are, you know, stealing from stores to eat because they're hungry they're, or they don't have the amount of money for the medicine that, you know, the gap between the poor and the rich has grown larger and larger and larger to the point where the people are going to start turning in this fashion where in order to survive, they're going to have to steal. You know, I used to do disaster uh, services. And, you know, sometimes it, people steal, you know, like people got mad, you know, with New Orleans when after Katrina hit and they're like, people are stealing, they're hungry. They need food, they need water. Of course they're gonna steal. There's this closed store there filled with food and water and that's what they need and nobody's bringing it to them. So they're gonna come and take it. And so people are getting to the point where they're gonna have to come take it. Um, and that's something that, you know, the people have to understand is that we have to join together and take what is ours. The taxes that we talk about, I know money has really no value as the woman was talking about, but the taxes that we put into the system, that's our money we pool together to, to serve us, the people. That money is supposed to be to make our lives better and it's not supposed to be taken, but it's being stolen to line the pockets of corporate interest of military interest but it's not being spent on us that's our money you know our road should be fixed our medicine should be paid for these are the things we're paying for every time we pay taxes and we're not getting our money's worth i i'd like to say something about that see i think our government owes us these things not because we pay taxes but because it's our government these are the people who are supposed to represent us. And, and one of the 
the, the big difference between a state and a and the federal government is that states absolutely do need taxes to pay for to pay for education, roads, everything. And they're struggling with it. That's another reason why the state movements cannot work. <clears throat> in certainly in the long run, even if a state succeeds, it can't it can't keep it going. But you know, people people ask, well, what's your plan? How are, we haven't been able to get Medicare for all? How are you going to make it work? Well, it's not easy. They're absolutely right. It's not easy, but that's not why we're doing it. it. Doing well, it, it takes necessary. You know, people think that you go out and protest once and that changes everything. Mm -hmm. It takes time. It takes persistence. It takes action after action after action. Right. It takes different forms of action from letter writing to street protest. Each right. of these forms have an importance to them. And when they are put together as a whole, they do have an impact. And that's, you know, people don't understand that. Like, why are we out on the street? Because we're getting visibility. We're informing people. We're educating people. That's what we're doing out in the street. Why are we, you know, writing letters? We're writing letters to let those politicians know we're watching them. And there's many of us, and they might not, you know, get to sit in their cushy chair anymore if they don't vote in our, in our way, you know. So why are we doing direct action? We are doing direct action to show the extremes that we need to go through. There was a, there was a protest where they had disabled people put aside their, their wheelchairs, and this action actually helped a lot, and they climbed stairs. They crawled up the stairs, I think, to the Capitol to yeah. show that you know the, they needed ADA laws and stuff like that, Americans with disability. And I think that was the thing that, you know, shot it to the top. So all of these things have a purpose and people don't enter activism on the same level. Some people have to get their foot, you know, their foot in the water first and feel it out and go, okay, I signed a petition today. Good. What are you going to do tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow, because that nothing bad happened when I signed that petition, I might hold the sign. And <laughs> soon, and, you know, you, you have to open these doors and make it, you know, you, ha you have to make it comfortable for people there. And there is not one form of protest that is better than another. They all work together in tangent. Absolutely. Um, and not to, to cut you off, Pluto, I didn't mean to do that. because. Yeah. You know, you're right. Like For me, I'm just not writing another letter. It's just not going to happen. I'm not going to send an email. I'm not going to do anything. You know we need health care. Yeah. This is my view. But another person, they may want, I will never tell another person, hey, don't write your congressman. Matter of fact, I would say, you know, you've never done it. It's a right. good thing to do. I personally... I'm, I'm, I am ready for just radical. Right. You never make somebody do what they're not willing to do. Right. Understand. And so, like I said, I'm not going to write another letter because I feel like, why am I doing it? I have a congressperson, Andre Carson, who um, I'm not too happy with right now, if I could just be honest, because when they had the numbers in the um, Congress, they didn't introduce the bill for Medicare for all now. They waited until they were out of power. Well, that's, that's on purpose to yeah. use it for a voting, you know, for, for elections. That's why. And that's, that's, that's it's purposely done yeah. that the things that they know the people really, really, really need right. and want, they hold it off in for the election years and go, you know, if you vote for me, I swear to you, we're going to take care of this. And then when they're in the office, they go, no, let's hold this aside because this is what gets us elected. Or we hear the, it's not the time. And I, I literally, that's another one I'm tired. I'm so tired of arguing with people. It's not the time. So you're going to tell a person that's selling bankruptcy, you know what? Now's not the time. 
That's what they told Dr. King, Tracy. Yeah, it's like if if I hear one more person, you know, this is a political statement and we'll end on this. If people aren't frustrated by a president that says, if Medicare for all gets to my desk, I'll veto it. And you're not concerned about that. To me, something's wrong with that. This is just me talking. That whole statement, it's not only just him, it's Republicans and Democrats that are against Medicare for all. And that's why, you know, I'm going to make a plug for my documentary because I'm going to do it. It doesn't even matter. Nobody has to support it. If I had to go to a blood bank to finance it, that's just what it's going to be for me because that's how dedicated I am to doing it. We need to say, hey, look, these are our stories and you're not going to ignore them anymore. Either you're going to give us Medicare for all or we're going to shut this whole thing down. That's where I'm at. And everybody's not going to be where I'm at. And that's perfectly fine because we each have to do, you know, our own part. Some people have to write letters. Some people have to make phone calls. Some people have to do direct action. But I'm speaking for me. I'm tired of it. I can't I can't write more letters to tell you that when you had power, you didn't exercise it. And now you want to just introduce this bill that you know isn't gonna pass. I'm tired of that. I'm so very frustrated. And that's I don't like to end on negative notes. I always like to end on the positive. I think we still have to keep fighting. It's the positive awesome. is you're still fighting. Tracy, we know we know how we're not going to get it by not doing anything. Exactly. That's that's every everything helps. Everything counts. Everything counts, and I think that's the point I want to make, and to especially the people that are going to watch this this evening. Everything counts. This is this is literally a life and death situation that we have on our hands. We absolutely positively need Medicare for all. And however we get it, like I said, I'm going to talk like I got it. I'm going to walk like I got it. I'm going to speak like I got it. I'm going to think that I have it. Because if I don't do that, what's the point in me fighting? I'm going to fight for the person that works a job, has employee-based insurance, but pays, you know, has a huge deductible to me, has co-pays every time they go to the doctor. I'm going to fight for the people like me that have type 1 diabetes. And if they miss their insulin, it's over. It's literally over. I'm going to fight for those people. Well, one, because I'm one of them. And everybody deserves to know that healthcare is a right. It's not a privilege. It's not something that rich people get and poor people don't. The fact that you are born guarantees you health care. And it's Health care, t- housing, food. Understand, but this is a water, Medicare for uh, all. These are our rights. Yes, these are our rights. Not because we're rich, not because we have privilege. It's because we were simply born. That's why we have a right to it. And until we get it, we're not stopping. Corporations won't stop us. PACs won't stop us. So I implore you all, if you have you know, join our Facebook group if you if you can and continue this conversation. And I hope that we have this next year. Um, I don't know if I'm speaking that just preemptively, but I hope we have it next year. And I want Indiana to do more actions, like together as a state, move us one body. I know we have the people in Northwest Indiana, the people in Bloomington, Indianapolis, I'm not so certain. But we need to move as one body. One and body. I to do that being, back more. Outside, being back outside, even though it was hot last year, stay, uh, uh, um, Tracy, I don't think any of us minded being outside. And I think being back outside uh, just to be visible, let's, let's do it both ways. But but being out and being visible. Yes, yeah, we are going to work on that. Definitely. And direct action is also a, a good thing if you if you're willing to do direct action, um, like let yourself get arrested for something, you know, like standing in the road or something like that gets attention of the news. 
and that's what you're looking for is the that's attention. Good. I do love. I did love the um, where they crawled up the stairs, um, and if, so if you could make a meaningful direct action, that's one of the best things to do. Something that that has a statement to it. Yeah. Um, and I do have. I think it's just that we're ha I'm sorry, Tracy. I think it's just a shame that we're having to go through all of these things anyway. It's just that it's something we can afford as a nation, that it makes no sense as a nation that we're not doing these things anyway, that we don't have health care. It's just a matter of pure negligence uh, that we don't. Um, and that's what to call it just apathy, greed. Um, it's a lot of things, but the main thing is that it's a shame. I will say this is that um, I hadn't really announced and we were gonna, we were announcing this weekend that I'm running for Senate again. I, it's just so oh. ironic that uh, <laughs> Tracy's, uh, I'm opening up today with, with the Medicare for all, which is, which is a theme, um, is one of my major platform items, but mental health care uh, and also, um, housing and, and medical care for all. So please follow our campaign. Um, of course, just like Tracy, we need donations to make it work. But know that when I get there and I'm saying when and not uh, if, know that when we get there, that this is going to be something that I constantly push, that I'm constantly writing bills for to get medical care for everyone all the time. And this is just not a platform item. I've been working on this for years and years and years. It's not gonna stop until I drop and I don't plan on dropping anytime soon so um, but, yeah so I'm just happy to you. I yeah. want everybody to say one thing that they got and I normally don't well yes I want everyone to say something that they learned today well not learned today name an action that you're going to take that you have never taken before or taken before yeah that you haven't did before that is going to advance single payer health care something that you've never done that you're going to consider doing to advance the issue of medicare for all i'll give you a um i've done almost all the actions including being surrounded at the state house by the police <laughs> and, and had to do police ballet in front of the state house so i i I don't know, you know, but there's no action that I have not done or the actions that I have not done, there's a reason for not doing them that, you know. Can I, can I, give, you, can I give you one? Have you phone banked? Yes. Okay. You've protested, obviously. Yes. Have you Direct action, yes. <laughs> Pardon? Have you, have you spoken on a radio show? Um, I've spoken on different, I've spoken on the news often, um, pretty well known here in Fort Wayne for United Activists. I haven't been active during the pandemic, but I did do other things during the pandemic through United <laughs> Activists, like, um, with United Activists during the, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protests that turned violent here by the police. Uh, we bailed out and paid for lawyers and negotiated the legal fees for almost all the protesters that were arrested. Um, so we'll think of something. We'll think of something. That you we'll think of something. You know what? I just keep doing what I do. I've done public speaking. Um, but yeah, I've I've done about everything. I can show you the photos of me being surrounded by the police at the state house. <laughs> And it was for Medicaid for All, and we were there to see the senator. <laughs> Anybody else that wants to offer something that they never considered before that they want to do to advance Medicare for All? I'll be in uh, a supporter of making a documentary that the famous filmmaker uh, Tracy is going to make. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I've never done that before, but I'm ready. I think we all will. Yeah, I, like I said, I never did this. And I, I questioned myself. I said, what have I never done? Before? I could help you with animation on it. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask you to stay on after because I, I do, I'm going to need some help. And I'll talk yeah. to you privately about that. And I'll talk to the rest of the group. You'll, you definitely will get my fundraising letters. 
I'm not going to ask you to give any more than, you know, if somebody's got the $25,000 in this group, I would greatly, I would, I would be so happy. You would make me happy. I'll but check, I'm not going to try. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to ask people for no more than $50 if you have it, whatever you have. Um, I'll get I'm that out in the next couple of weeks. Um, but that was the number one thing I thought. I thought I'm not writing a letter. I'm not, I'm not making a call. I'll make a documentary. That's exact. I mean, that I, it just kind of popped in my head. I don't know how, I don't know where I come up with these ideas. Like I came up with the March, but I'm glad you said that, um, Dr. McCray about next year. Yes. I'm announcing it right now. Next year, next year's March is going to be outside and we're going to try to stream it. So you know, in January, I'll kind of be emailing people like, hey, the committee's forming to get this plan because of one person trying to plan a march is not, I, I won't do that again. Will not, not going to do it, not going to try it. I don't have that type of ability. But well, you, know, you know, you have the support of March for Medicare for All. Yes. Yeah. And Virginia, if you can stay on too, I have a, some questions for you that I want to ask. So sure. um, look in the uh, chat. May I okay. say something, please? Yes, uh, ma'am. I put a link in the chat to an article about uh, the dangerous myth of taxpayer dollars. And I'm thinking about uh, Dr. McCray, your campaign, because I have a real problem. Whether or not you believe that, that federal taxes are needed for these programs, talking about our taxpayer money, I believe, uh, advances the narrative that people who pay taxes have a right to these programs. And there are plenty of people who don't. And, and uh, people have all kinds of built-in prejudices against uh, poor people, obviously, people who, who don't pay taxes, who are, are uh, parasites. And, and so I really believe that our government owes us this because it's our government not whether whether we pay taxes or not or how much you pay and how much i pay so i'm just so i put this i put this um article the dangerous myth of taxpayer money in the um in the that's chat that's and I, I would love if you would just check it out okay so i'm going to pick on the people that haven't talked much um paul do you have anything that you want to add i think he's saying no no, I, I wasn't saying no. I was trying to figure out. I'm on my phone, not on a laptop. So oh, it's a little yeah. difficult to uh, navigate. And um, um, I appreciate everyone's remarks here. Uh, we were just on the radio here in Gary, Indiana, the other day, and uh, we're planning a uh, another door-to-door -door canvassing uh, with our um, our. Uh, Our, our uh, 10 question poll that we did in uh, our congressman's precinct. We're gonna do a precinct here in Gary where we go there door to door again. And uh, I'm sure we'll get the same results and actually better than we got in the, before. Cause um, you know, the one, the, the one thing that uh, Pastor Green talked about the, uh, the um, uh, winding down of the Medicaid uh, um, payments that's going on now you know the the kaiser family foundation is tracking that and it's and it's uh it's shameful and there's just been a recent study put out that the people that are affected by um this um uh medicaid is poor people and most of the poor people are uh people of color and and children and so Medicaid was um, established as a racist uh, uh, reaction to Medicare going in at the time, because uh, in this, the the uh, there were all the Democrats, uh, Southern Democrats, Dixiecrats at the time, that uh, in the early '60s when it was going in, when Medicare was going in, that they didn't want, um, you know, they didn't want black people to come into their uh, uh, hospitals. They were trying to keep the hospital segregated. And that was even in the North hospitals. Some hospitals were segregated. And Medicare was going to make hospitals integrated. 
and the, one of the answers was to how can we uh, how can we um, slice off poor people uh, in Medicare and get them in a program that's state run, and uh, when state when states run it, then it can be there's more racism applied to the to the uh, program. So we're trying to educate people here in Northwest Indiana on uh, what's happening, and we're trying to. Uh, get our congressman on board, you know, uh, Andre Carson down in uh, um, Indianapolis there, Tracy. I mean, you, you should be happy that he's he signed on to that legislation. And the legislation has been reintroduced every uh, session of Congress since back in Conyers day. And uh, even before that um, uh, with um, um, uh, Dingle's, uh, Dingle had introduced legislation even before that. Uh, the, one of the co-sponsors with um, uh, Primella Jayapal is Debbie Dingle and her, her uh, uh, father had put it in. So there's, there's, there's history of uh, Congress trying to do something. And there's more congressmen on the, um, Democrat congressmen on the uh, legislation than there's ever been in the past, so you know we we're making progress, and uh, uh, the Senate and the House bills were both put in on the same day. It was kind of an event this year, and uh, next year we're talking about having a, a public uh, demonstration. Next year is an election year. Who knows who we can get uh, uh, on for that uh, for that next year? So yeah. I applaud. Uh, and there's also a document, there's a healthcare documentary coming out soon, Tracy, I don't know if you're aware of that. It's put on by, I don't know if it's healthcare now or- it's health, health I think it's healthcare now, but you know, I'm still gonna do mine. It, right, it's, right, it's, Everybody, everybody's is different. But I'm just saying that there's, a, there's something coming out soon on that. And, uh, and I applaud your efforts on this and uh, appreciate everyone who spoke today. Thank you. So I'm going to end this again. This will be for the people that will be seeing this later. Like I said, if Virginia and Pluto could stay behind, I got some questions I want to ask. But to everyone watching this video at a later time this evening, we need Medicare for all, not 10 years from now, not two years from now. We need it right now. This, again, is a life and death situation that's going on in our country. We're going to keep working. We will not quit. The other side doesn't stop, and neither are we. So remember to subscribe to my channel. And if you're interested in the documentary, I'll be linking it into the description section. And I thank everybody here today. Um, I didn't do my best effort in organizing, and I'm going to improve on that um, as I, you know, refine what needs to be refined. But keep working for single payer health care. It's the right thing to do for all the right reasons. Thank you, everyone, and have a fantastic day. Thank you. Stacey, can you Thanks, uh, copy, everyone. copy the chat and share it with us, too, please? Yes. Um, yes, I'm going to send this, but I'm going to pause because I got, like I said, I got specific questions for um, Pluto and, and, and Virginia.